Okay. Hi, everyone. We are two minutes in, so I'm going to kick us off. I'm sure we'll have a few late stragglers, but that's totally okay. Um, I'm Matt Garden. I'm an innovation fellow here at Sci City, the Center for Innovative Thinking. This is your first time to Sci City. Welcome. If you're coming back, welcome back. Um, it's so good to have you here. And um, before we get started, um, and before I introduce the speaker, I do just want to go over a couple things. Um, one here at Sci City, a big piece of what we do is in inclusivity and making sure everyone feels welcome. Um, so if at any time, if anyone, if we can be helpful in making you feel welcome, especially in this virtual setting, which I know people are feeling a little bit disconnected and we're all feeling a little bit of pandemic fatigue, um, please let us know. That's what we're here for too, to help you feel welcome and connected, especially to um, resources within entrepreneurship and innovation here at Yale. Um, with that, do um, feel free to message us in the chat or um, Ellen's here as well. The, me, me and Ellen will be here in the back in the help. Um, and there might be some times for engagement, but if you're just wanting just to kind of listen in and be just kind of in the background, feel free to message Ellen as well. I'm saying like you're just kind of here to be here in the background. It's totally okay. So with that, I'm going to introduce Olga Barnicki, who is a managing director at Techstars um, in FinTech. And as a you know, Techstars alum myself, I definitely can vouch that Techstars is amazing. And I'm sure Olga is a fantastic managing director, even though I didn't go through her program. But managing, um, just knowing how the Techstars programs are, they're pretty wonderful. And I know that all the managing directors I've interacted with have been pretty wonderful as well. So with that, Olga, the floor is yours. I'm really looking forward to hearing about this jobs to be, jobs to be done framework. All right, so considering this is 5.30 uh, and we all kind of do suffer a bit from the Zoom fatigue, I decided to tell this to you as basically as a story that happened to me as a founder. Um, and I find that uh, kind of like maybe encountering this framework exactly the way that I encountered it could encourage you to sort of start, start liking it or at least respecting it as much as I do. <laughs> so it was 2007 and eight uh, in that time frame it was a pretty difficult time to raise any capital at all. It was a real uh, strong recession. But nevertheless, this is when I found a co-founder and together we were starting a startup uh, that was a screen sharing startup. Now, all of us now suffer from Zoom fatigue. So everybody is quite clear what screen sharing and video conferencing really is and what the value of it is. However, in 2007 and eight, it took a lot of convincing. <laughs> so I had to go in front of a lot of people and when I would present to them, they would tell me, ah, do we really need it? Can't we just send an email? Can't we just have a phone call? Um, so it was not an easy startup to launch. We had fantastic technology and it was a patent pending technology where at the time we were the only ones who could establish a video connection without downloading any software. Back then you would have to download WebEx first on both sides and only then you could connect we could do this instantly, web level. So on one hand, I felt we have something, we have something special, our tech is interesting. And I also thought, hmm, there are so many directions to go. You can do B2C, you can do this, that, the other. But as I started, my co-founder was a technical co-founder. So everything else was on me, raise capital, figure out who the customers are, get the customers, get some revenue. So it was all on my uh, wide shoulders. <laughs> And um, as I started going to all the different places where screen sharing web conferencing could have been used, as we now know, there is kind of like a thousand places to go. I started realizing, wow, you know, I can't go 10 different places. We don't have the resources and the time to go off to 10. Picking one is quite difficult because what if out of the 10 that potential uh, applications that I see, the one that I would pick would be the, exactly the one that would for some reason fail. What do I do? Uh, at Harvard Business School, one of my favorite professors was Clay Christensen, actually my the favorite professor. Uh, Clay, if you've, if you've never watched any video with him or if you never read any of his, uh, any of his books, he is famous for disruptive innovation. He kind of coined that phrase and co coined the term and that's what people know him for. I wasn't quite sure if the screen sharing technology that I had with my co-founder was or wasn't disruptive innovation. I read the definition of it a few times. It seemed to me to be. 
but I wanted sort of a little bit of a confirmation. I emailed Clay, he remembered me from the class and I asked him if I come to Boston, would he kind of help me think through how to take this company to market? He's like, yeah, of course I remember you, come over. I show up in Boston. I have a fantastic presentation, nice deck. In this deck I have, this is the potential customer and this is the persona and this is the potential customer for this user and this is the persona. And it was a very, very nice deck. So I come in and Clay has a very, very soft demeanor and yet, you know, I'm sitting there trying to impress him. I go through the entire presentation and Clay in this very, very calm uh, voice tells me, Okay, you know, the, the, this is very good thinking, um, good presentation. But have you thought about what any of these potential users that you see, have you thought of which job they will be hiring your product to do? I just sort of sat there and I was blinking and I wasn't really sure what he was asking me, to be honest. <laughs> So he looked at me and he said, let me explain. As you may know, I run a consulting company at the same time as being a professor, a few professors do that. My consulting company is very, very small. We take on interesting projects only. We got a call from McDonald's and McDonald's, having known the kind of work that we've done, said that they just fresh coming off very deep research done by, you know, very high profile consulting firm, which will be, you know, left nameless for this presentation. But, you know, it was a high profile project, high price point as well. McDonald's paid, they done the job. And as you probably would imagine, which kind of work do we do when we study in market markets? You know, that's what kind of they teach us in, in marketing classes. Who is the potential user? What is the persona? What is the demographic? You know, what is the income level? Uh, it, so we, we try to kind of do our best job as this kind of market segmentation, potential sort of persona imagination, if you will, right? And we're trying to understand, okay, if this is the potential customer, if this is the potential customer segment, what is this product market match? That's exactly what this large company has done for, or if, if your product is already in the market, you can just go and ask current users, ask them what they think about the product, and then ask them what they would like to see that would be better. You know, seems like a logical thing to do. That's exactly what this consulting firm has done. They went, they talked to all the current, uh, and, the, and the task was McDonald's was noticing that, you know, they were selling a certain amount of milkshakes, but, they wouldn't sell any more of them or any less of them. We just almost stuck on exactly the same level. They wanted to find out what could they do in order to sell more milkshakes. So the consulting firm went, talked to all the current milkshake drinkers and asked them, what would you do to the milkshake? And, you know, different individuals said, well, if it's only was more bananas than it, or if it was only thicker, if it was only this, it was the other, the other. McDonald's went ahead and created additional flavors and they will put them in the market and they would notice that, this that there is zero change to the sales of the milkshakes. It was kind of interesting. So they'd done this a couple of times, thinking maybe the first time they didn't quite hear what the customers were saying. Maybe they need to listen more carefully. <laughs> so, you know, this time they went ahead and created a chocolate one and then a blueberry one, et cetera, changed the texture, zero difference for sales. So they called Clay and his consulting firm to see what is it they're not kind of understanding? What, what, what is the puzzle here? Why talking to customers isn't working and isn't resulting in any higher of a revenue stream? So Clay and his team decided to go about it the following way. They would stand in front of McDonald's, they just picked the location, and they would just observe who would come in and which day or which time of the day and what would they do? And from that exercise, they noticed that the majority of people who purchased milkshake were alone and came in the morning between 7 and 8 a.m. They would buy the drink and they would leave with it in their hand and they will not really get anything else. 
That was already an interesting observation. They didn't quite expect that milkshakes are sold in the morning quite so much. The next sort of wave of milkshake buying started happening somewhere like between 3 and 4 p.m. There they observed somebody with a kid coming in, buying a shake, you know, staying, and uh, or potentially leaving. They came back next day, and in a language that the people could sort of understand, they would sort of come up to those individuals who would buy the shake early in the morning and are leaving to go to their car, and they would ask them something along the lines of, what do you think you're buying the shake for? Which job would it be doing for you? And once kind of understanding was reached to what that meant, what they started discovering is that majority of people purchase the drink because they had a long commute to work. The commute is boring. You're just sitting in the car for an hour. There is nothing to do. And, you know, they're not quite yet hungry. It's like 7, 8 a.m. So it's not really mealtime, mealtime. Yet they kind of know towards 9 or 10, they will get hungry. So there they are in the car. It's nice to have something in your hand. With one hand, you're sort of steering the wheel. With the other hand, you know, you can easily kind of drink something. And once they kind of describe, they all approximately were using it for the same thing. And then they were being asked, like, okay, well, if you're not hiring this drink for this job, what do you normally hire? And people started saying things like, hmm, put this way, I guess sometimes I hire a bagel. But it's kind of terrible. It gets all crummy and you, know, you see the mess all over in the car. Sometimes I guess I would hire a sneaker bar. That makes me feel really sort of uh, guilty. I trade, tend to not want to hire the sneaker bar again. Once in a while I do hire a donut, but you know, that's also just a little bit too much of a guilt feeling. I'd say that for this job, the milkshake does the job the best. All right, and then in the afternoon, um, like the, the figuring out what the job was, was a little bit easier because majority of the parents said, they're here after school trying to reward a kid for a good, you know, good job uh, in, in the class during the day, or just you know having a little bit of a parent kid time. All right, so with this information, what did McDonald's do? With this information, McDonald's realized that creating additional flavors is not really going to move the needle. What they did do to the drink, however, is knowing that people are sort of trying to kind of prolong having the drink for their entire commute, they made it even thicker and almost even harder to gulp up. <laughs> so it took you even longer to finish it. So they lasted you for you know good 45 minutes or an hour. And um, it was really a quite successful conclusion for McDonald's. And what it brought to them as well is the realization that they're not competing on say flavors with other fast food um, restaurants. Say they're not competing with Burger King. They're not really competing with Wendy's on milkshakes. What they're really having is a morning product that is almost like an entertainment during a commute. And they already are doing well with this product. Additional flavors do really not make a lot of a difference, but the thickness of the product does. So it was a quite different way to think. And it was, in, in a way, uh, what I realized, to a certain extent, it's almost the opposite what they teach us in the marketing classes because you're not thinking about your product as who is the customer and you're not trying to define the customer characteristics or demographics and you're not necessarily trying to create customer personas. The question that you need to have in your mind is of which job would this product perform for the customer and and a way, a way to understand competition, therefore, is to understand, well, most usually, this job is being getting done somehow already now. There must be a way that consumers are accomplishing the job using something else. So it's kind of like your task to notice what are they currently using? And what they're currently using may be something that's 
not really even in your periphery as a competitive product because it could be out of a completely different sector. For example, you may have a technological solution. I don't know, somebody may have post-it notes and you may not be thinking of that, right? In, in, or like in this instance, your competition is not other milkshakes, it's potentially other items which you can somewhat eat with one hand on the way to work. So it kind of forces very different thinking on you as an entrepreneur or a venture launcher from say within a large company. And this thinking is not easy to do. For example, even once I kind of understood <laughs> that what I need, which kind of answers that I need, there are two challenges with that. One is what if your product not yet in the market, right? This kind of a say observing of current users and noticing or asking them which product they're hiring um, which job they're hiring the product to do is possible when the product is already in the market. What do you do when the product is not in the market? That's rather complex. And, you know, and, and the other piece of the puzzle is with those potential products, a lot of them are technology-based products where there could be a multitude of uses. It's very common to something that, you know, one could maybe potentially see as a technical platform. And then there's, you know, 10, 15, 20 potential applications. And how do you think through job to be done? Do you think for each potential application? So we sat together with Clay, uh, thinking of my screen sharing company. And we didn't conclude anything because while I understood sort of the methodology, I still was in front of the fact that I do have probably 15 potential uses and how do I go and define the jobs to be done for each one of them? Or how do I almost eliminate out of those 15, which may be two or three to go out? I drove back home from Boston. I thought about which job would people hire screen sharing to do my entire way back. And I came back, I explained sort of the framework to my co-founder and together we spent countless hours trying to understand this. We finally did zero in on a potential of, on, on a very specific job and a very specific segment into which we went. And I truly probably would have to credit the success of our startup, which you know got both funded and eventually acquired by Oracle, I have to truly give credit to the jobs to be done framework. It was intellectually very difficult for me to take it and put it on my startup, but it's what truly allowed me to put aside the demographic, the segment thinking, and to truly zero in who is, which kind of job can my screen sharing get done for someone? What we define for ourselves is sales. Um, the sales associate, when they are chatting with someone online via chat, very often approach a point where it's difficult to just describe on, on via text what you're looking at. Say it's a shirt that goes with a certain tie or you know, a little bit more visual is needed. So the job that we were doing for sales associates in high-end retail stores is allowing them to feel one with the customer and to see exactly what the customer sees so that they can just give them the best advice possible and establish a personal relationship with them. Now, out of all the 14 different things, 14, 15, 16, we had the different number every day we probably wouldn't have picked one if we did not start thinking about jobs to be done because it seemed very particular to us based on the other ones. It's, uh, it, it did have kind of a relatively large market potential, but it did feel like very, very particular play in a very, very specific B2B space. But what we did realize, it, the job that needed to be done was quite clear. Where in the other segments that I did attempt, um, I think our product was seen as almost 
nice to have, but it was always a secondary thought. And there was no real specific job for which people will just sort of pull out the screen sharing and use this and this only. So what I wanted to do originally, I was going to try to task you to think about if you're working on any sort of a startup idea, can you think of how to go about doing this for your startup? But what I can also offer is this. Recently, I was trying to help a startup uh, and I'll just describe what they do. And maybe we can almost sort of try together to tackle their job to be done. They are a relatively simple startup uh, in terms of just description of it. They are making vitamins for dogs, vitamins and supplements, which have a flavor in them. And you can just sprinkle them on top of a dog food. And, you know, you give your dog all the nutrition and the taste along with the food, whichever food that you're giving. So they were struggling with marketing and um, they, again, were doing what we're taught, right? They, are this, they were trying to segment dog owners into different segments, into different you know, genders, ages, numbers of dogs, et cetera. And they were wondering then how to adjust the product based on this. And I started asking them, which job do they think dog parents, so-called dog parents, are hiring this product to do, they were quite puzzled. So, um, and they also, they had a couple of customers already, very early on customers. They didn't have a lot of customers. They had about 15 customers or so, maybe a little bit more. And they could ask them questions. They have this product. There is some usage, it's not scaling. They are trying to understand what to do next. And my advice to them, apply jobs to be done framework, which they do understand. And they just got as puzzled as I was when Clay told me this. Now, how would you go about it? Or what would be your guess is the job that a vitamin sprinkled on top of dog food would be doing? Anyone? Any any brave individual at all? Sure, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Uh -huh. I would think it might be to get the dog to eat a picky food, like a picky eater who doesn't want to eat their food. And you're trying to, you know, the alternatives are stuff a vitamin in their mouth, which they might not like. And so you're trying to get them these vitamins. They have no other good way to tackle it. And so the job is get them their vitamins to a dog specifically that doesn't want to eat them. Interesting. I'll push a little then why would you give the dog the vitamin to begin with, right? Uh, sure, I mean, it's probably a dog with some health problems or a concerned, um, concerned dog owner, right? Maybe those are two different jobs. One is to kind of satiate the owner's internal feeling of not being like a good enough dog owner. The other might be uh, because their vet told them they should, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. You know, this is exactly, you're, you're getting there. Um, it took them a little while. What they, after, you know, relatively kind of deep conversations and trying to be as perceptive as they possibly could, is they found out that the job seems to be based on a little bit of that feeling of guilt on one hand, but the profound job was their dog owners wanted their dogs to live longer. So it wasn't so much even about fixing a problem a dog has, but you know, as you realize, obviously dogs live shorter lives than we do. And those individuals who are in love with dogs, dog owners, <laughs> they want their pets to live forever. <laughs> and uh, as idealistic as it seems, that seemed to be the job that people were hiring the product to do. Now, some of the things you mentioned, they also kind of came along with that, but they were quite secondary. You know, is it easy for the dog to swallow? Is it not easy for the dog to swallow, et cetera? But 
they become more like features, if you will. And I guess what happens with us now as entrepreneurs, we very often confuse features with benefits and then now with job to be done, right? The confusion between features and benefits, it's quite common. You probably see it and you probably confuse some of these things yourself. God knows I do sometimes. And I actually have to sit down and quite clarify myself. Is this the features or the benefits? Uh, but jobs to be done framework kind of gets you out of the feature benefit type of thinking, which allows you to kind of elevate a little bit and truly understand where is my company? Like, where is my product? Where does exactly it belong? What is the job that it's doing? Um, it helps somewhat with the marketing message once you also get that because the marketing message be could become less about features and benefits and more towards that inside of what, what is the job that's being done. Um, what I... <laughs> An interesting thing that I've noticed, and um, I've been a mentor at, the Cor at Cornell Tech for quite a while, maybe four or five years now, and their um, lab has, you know, ha has very successful run. They generate a lot of startups, and that's great. Something happened last year that I started noticing coming in as a mentor that there's something different about the startups, and they kind of are getting to the point of what the ideas are faster. I just sort of took that mental notice and someone in one of the conversations mentioned, oh, did you think of the jobs to be done framework? I'm like, wow, they added it. They literally added the jobs to be done thinking last year and um, they haven't had it. They kind of would talk about, you know, the design thinking, the lean and the agile methods, which of course the methods with which we built, but Interestingly, they added the jobs to be done as a framework last, last year. And it's amazing how much it focused the teams, right? To think about, um, and on a team normally there is, you know, somebody on the business side, somebody on the technical side, somebody on the design side. So people with those different talents, if they truly focus on the job to be done, there is less of this sort of fraying of attention towards the features and benefits. Um, now, let's try another one. The other one that um, is kind of harder. For example, what job do you think Zoom, uh, what, do, what job do you think people hire Zoom to do? And that's where it gets hard, right? Because you think about something that you use every day, right? And it's kind of, it seems obvious. I mean, I know what I use Zoom for, but um, when you start thinking about, huh, but what about others? What are they using Zoom for? Not necessarily what I'm using it for, right? So what is the job that people hire Zoom to do? See how complex that is? <laughs> and this we is have, something we use every day, right? <laughs> we have one hand from uh, Farine. <laughs> hey, Farine, what do you think? Hey, Olga. Um, this is probably a little far-fetched, but um, I'm thinking it's to uh, be able to have um, meetings that you would normally travel for. It's to be able to, to do that via Zoom instead of traveling. True. I, 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 I think that's, you know, that's certainly part of it, right? But then again, what did we use to use meetings for? Physical meetings, right? We use them for something. Physical meetings also had some sort of a job, which has now changed the format. And the format change is a little bit more along the lines of, you know, features and benefits, right? So it used to be a physical meeting. Now it's not physical meeting. But what are we trying to accomplish in a meeting, I suppose? JP, go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll take another shot at this, I guess. Um, I think my job for Zoom usually is to try and build some kind of 
human connection with the other person in a way that I can't do over a phone call. And I think some of that is the same with an in-person meeting. And just in terms of building kind of a team environment and getting to know people better than I can through like building trust essentially is what I'm trying to do usually with a, a Zoom yeah. call. Uh -huh. That's interesting, okay. I'm gonna put Matthew on the spot. Matthew, what do you think? <laughs> this is a tough one. I feel like I would, uh, JP's answer about trust is a good one though. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the other thing that comes to mind is like, I mean, from my standpoint is like moving like things forward. So in terms of like, that's what you would do. Like, I'm also thinking about like, in terms of like, what would you do in an in-person meeting? Like, why do we even have those meetings versus like an email? Like what's the difference between the two? Yeah. So, right. It's like, you can't move that idea or concept or this, like you can't make progress because it's like, you can't communicate effectively enough through an email or other way. Like it's just a communication effectively. I feel like I'm talking in circles a little bit too. Mm -hmm. See how hard it was for me to build a screen sharing company in 2007 and 2008? <laughs> it was really challenging, right? Um, Ellen, what do you think? Um, I was going to say, actually, as Farine was talking, that it was uh, Zoom's job is to minimize emails, but that's, that, that's a negative job, not a positive one. Um, it's tough. I'm actually stumped on this one. I'm, I'm either going too broad, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the job to be done is to, to communicate or, or going into like really tiny things like to minimize on emails. I don't know where the Goldilocks place is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, um, you know, another analogy, I think I saw it somewhere on the internet, they would say the job, say the way to think about it is there is a nail, right? And the job of getting the nail in the wall, could do it with a hammer, could do it, I don't know, with a piece of wood, could do it with your own head, I suppose, right? <laughs> Hopefully not. But so what you use to get the job done is secondary. The question is, what is the job? The job is actually getting the nail into the wall, right? So when you buy a hammer, in theory, it's not the hammer you care for, it's the ability to get the nail in the wall. Right. So just because I bought this hammer and you maybe thought of, I don't know, I'll just use something heavy and bang it in. We got the job done, you and I, right? Just use different things. So, you know, I would like to put out a hypothesis of the following kind. I think that potentially the job of a meeting is to get to a yes to get to some kind of an agreement, to hear yes on the other side. Does it make any sense? It's, you know, as you're saying, we go to meetings, why, right? Yes, we want better communication, we want trust, for what, right? I think maybe what, what it is, is that we want to hear a yes in the end, right? Like we want to get to that yes, that somebody says, yes, let's go ahead. Yes, let's get something done. Yes, I got it. Yes, uh, yes, that is, you know, I got, I got it. But, you know, when I think about the different uses of Zoom, you know, we, for example, now are discussing a subject and I guess we also have some form of a yes or agreement that we're trying to do, like intellectual agreement, if you will, right? It could have been more of an operational meeting where we would have been getting to a yes, yeah, let's go get this done. You know, you do this, I do this, you do this, and we 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 gotten it done. Right? To a certain extent, I guess email communication, in a way, is trying to get the same job done. We're trying to get to some kind of a decision or a yes at the end. Hopefully, not a no. <laughs> we don't want to know. <laughs> All right, so, but what is interesting then, once you know that this is the job, right? If this is the job, I, you know, I'm not really sure if I, coined, if I really nailed it. I'm, I'm not really, because th this is how complicated, how complicated that is. There are certain different layers. And as you think through this, 
you kind of sometimes uncover another layer and sometimes you feel, I got it, I got it, I got it. And then you go, wait, wait, no, 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 wait. <laughs> There's, there is another layer to it. And maybe I'm only thinking about, you know, the, the surface of it still. If this is the case, you know, uh, but if, if this was the hypothesis, do you see how it would inform the company's sort of marketing strategy quite differently? In fact, I do think that if we now look at the current sort of some of the ads that we see, it seems to be going that direction. We see some teams collaborating and getting to some sort of a yes and, you know, building something or doing something together. There, there've been some of commercials in, in, in that direction. Previous WebEx commercials were not like that. WebEx used to kind of show task, this, that, and it's easy to connect and it's easy to do this. And they were kind of like constantly talking about ease of use, which by the way, WebEx is not that easy to use, <laughs> but you know, that's what they would emphasize. I guess potentially realizing that this is what customers were kind of concerned about and, and this is a feature ease of use, right? And you know, they just focused the messaging on, on that. So I potentially, because we all dove into the Zoom lives and providers of this technology started thinking a bit deeper about, hmm, what do we do, right? We all kind of are easy to use. We all kind of do basically have the same abilities. What, what is that we give to people? Right? So it kind of forces a company to sometimes ask a deeper question. But if you're an entrepreneur, you better be asking these questions at the very beginning, not later on. <laughs> WebEx has hundreds of millions and they can sort of afford to wait a little while before they figure things out. Right? So, but as an entrepreneur, it's um, the way it's also helpful is at the very least, it can allow you to notice sooner that you are a little bit too obsessed about either a feature or a benefit. And if this is something that you observe about your startup idea and you'll go to market, you may want to sort of ring a bell in your own mind saying, hmm, do I just, do, am I over investing in my belief in a feature or a benefit? And just a feature or just a benefit generally cannot build a sustainable business. It's only when you hit on a job to be done, a repeatable job that people will repeatedly hire your product to do, that's when you can build a scalable business. Um, and until you do so, you probably spend too much on customer acquisition, right? Because you're convincing everybody of some sort of a feature or benefit you don't pop into people's minds when they're thinking of a particular job. So for example, you know, if I do need to, you know, drive a nail and I, you know, I need to think of a hammer from the point of view of a hammer manufacturers, right? But if the hammer doesn't come to my mind and they just keep spending and spending the money to get my attention and to tell me why this would be much better than if I use something else, it's not a sustainable business. Customer acquisition cost is too high. Churn is too high usually, right? So. This is, I guess, why I'm kind of a fanatic of this approach, even though intellectually it's rather difficult. It's not as simple as, oh, just segment the market. Ah, just look up, you know, the incomes and, and, and the demographic characteristics of the customers. I'm noticing that venture capitalists are starting to understand the value of that. In fact, there are some venture capital funds that would actually even now ask you or notice in your presentation that you are not getting which job people are hiring your product to do. And when you come in with a deck that does, you know, the traditional market segmentation, they would kind of go, yeah, nice deck, but <laughs> you can't scale because you don't understand what people will hire you for you to do. And why would this be repeatedly? And when then they want you to see the competition from that perspective, which is, I don't know if you noticed, but competitive matrix used to be kind of two by twos and then they sort of changed into something else. These days people want you to see what is called now a pedal. Literally it looks like a pedal. You can like look it up online, but 
The reason it's a petal and something is meeting in the middle because they want you to see things broader, like as a landscape and not necessarily only your direct competitors, because normally as direct competitors, we will see other milkshakes, right? <laughs> Uh, at best. So it's the combination of seeing the job to be done, or rather, it's the insight of seeing the job to be done quite clearly that in turn allows you to see the landscape in the correct way in which you're competing, and which in turn allows you to create a product that people would think of every time that they're hiring something for the job. So um, I just, <laughs> it's, it's um, I run an accelerator now and there are 10 companies in it. And what is interesting to me is how challenging it is for each team to truly get that themselves. And sometimes as a managing director, it's difficult for me to help with that as well, because it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the work that's a few layers in if you will, right? that takes some sitting with some thinking through. So if you are working on a startup or have an idea, um, my recommendation would be to try to apply this kind of thinking and see where you get. And even if it's at first frustrating, don't completely drop it. Maybe put it aside for a little while, come back to it. Come back in a couple of days again and try to apply the jobs to be done framework again until you feel that you got somewhere that's that's beyond the features and benefits type of a situation. All right, let's see if there are any questions. There is something in chat, someone asks something. Uh, do we done? I want to feel better. Oh, I want to feel better. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's when we were talking about the dogs. It is true. Um, it's interesting, like in the dual market products, what I mean by that, for example, you're selling something to parents, but it's for the kids, right? You kind of have a dual customer. Because the kid, you know, should like it. If the kid hates it, probably the parent will never buy it again. But the actual purchaser is the parent, right? So like it or not, you're marketing to the parent. So like, like it or not, you know, it's another la layer of complexity, right? It's something that's a job for the kid, but probably, probably something the kid likes or wants, but there's a certain job that the parent is hiring that item to do, right? Which is kind of complex, double complexity, because they're double, double, double user, if you will, or a user is a step away, the kid and the parent. So, okay, any questions or anybody is working on any kind of a startup idea? Maybe we can together try to brainstorm on what the job to be done would be for it. No one is working on any startup idea. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, any questions for me? I um, there is additional. If you would like to kind of dive into into in, into it a little bit deeper, there is maybe a video or two on YouTube with Clay Christensen speaking about it. Um, again, you know there are funds now. There are actually a couple of funds on the West Coast that their managing directors are just such fanatics of this framework that they wouldn't invest in a company that doesn't have the answer. <laughs> they publish blogs and they talk about it a, a good amount. I have a feeling that this is a framework as we speak is going to become something that's significantly more known and respected than it has been to date. Uh, it seems to me both entrepreneurs and investors are starting to understand that that's something like that's a piece of our sort of intellectual puzzle as as early investors and entrepreneurs that kind of has been missing. And um, again, you know, I'll have to credit the success of the company that I grew and um, exited from to to like forcing this thinking on myself and making um, thinking through every possibility in, in terms of the jobs to be done and picking a very particular job for a very particular user that became repeatable, that scaled, and that made our customer acquisition cost lower because people could just think of us when they needed that job to be done. All right, so that's all I've got <laughs> in my toolbox. So, uh, 
maybe one question, maybe to kick it off here, I'll go for questions. I guess I have two questions that are kind of tied together. One, I mean, for a startup, like let's say, you know, there's another food company like a McDonald's that came to you. Instead of saying competitors are Wendy's, Burger King, and these other fast food restaurants, but they said it's like, oh, a donut and other things like, how do you come off as not like this like lunatic that doesn't actually know, right, what they're talking about? Like, does that, how, I guess, how do you frame it so you actually feel like you know what you're talking about? Or maybe that just the way you pitch it, maybe it's still, it still kind of shows you. And then the second part of that question is, like, is this framework, especially if you're in like a really competitive industry, like a food business or retail, like, is this framework probably even more important to understand, especially in like really competitive spaces? Um, you know, I think one of the best ways to sort of, uh, first of all, make sure you're not speaking with a lunatic, speak with a lot of lunatics, <laughs> right? If they all seem just as lunacy, uh, then they probably are correct anyways, right? Because they're kind of like a user, um, you know, many users probably will not have only a very obscure case. What ideally, if you could do, even if you haven't launched your own product, again, think about it. It doesn't necessarily really matter. If you already have a hypothesis, what they might be using for this job now, and it has nothing to do with your segment, for example. If you could put yourself in a situation where you could observe them almost doing whatever that they're doing, even if they cannot quite very well articulate it themselves, you would, however, notice. Um, like, for example, until I actually observed, literally from you know, behind the shoulder of a sales associate in Nordstrom who was selling, actually, it was, he, he was trying to pick a tie for someone's shirt. Until I kind of almost was like a fly on his shoulder and I saw how his day was going and how his interactions was going. And when he went, yeah, need this. Hmm? Even if he verbally didn't quite express it to me quite clearly, I kind of saw or I, I observed the need for the job of seeing what the other person is seeing. I, I would have noticed the job anyway. So even if someone is not quite that articulate, right? But if you, in a way, ask them, just if you can't watch them, ask them to describe them to you then. Okay, you come to work and you do what, right? And then you do this and you do this, and then what do you do, right? So you're almost trying to kind of observe them in action and see that decision. It's that decision that they make. Ah, I need this for this. Right. It's that decision that you're kind of trying to notice in them. So, and you're trying to figure out what is the decision that they're making in that moment. Farin? Mm -hmm. Hey again, Olga. Um, my question was just around this framework. And if, um, if you're in like a very conceptual stage of your startup where you have the idea, you're essentially trying to mature that idea. Is this a way to kind of help you mature the idea? Or are there other like preliminary steps you would advise to take before you kind of go down the path of, you know, doing the uh, jobs to be done exercise? Well, how conceptual is conceptual, right? <laughs> you know, do you, do you have a hypothesis? The second that you have something that's a hypothesis, right? You may not even build an MVP quite yet. It's just that, you know, without an MVP, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get feedback. But if you have a hypothesis and you also can think of what are people using for this, what my product will be doing, what are they using now for that? So you don't necessarily have to build anything out at all, which you need to go figure out, ah, this is what they use now. Maybe this, maybe that. Let me go observe them using these two different things, right? And let me see when and how do they make decisions to go ahead and grab whatever that thing is and use it? Because hopefully eventually I become that thing that they grab and use right now, right? So kind of looking at what's being used for that now and how it's being used. Okay, gotcha. And then maybe from, if you don't mind, like maybe from your perspective, like at Techstars and, and, and at an accelerator, what would be your expectations for like the most basic requirements 
um, to let's say come to an accelerator and say, I have this idea and I, you know, what would be your most basic um, expectations? It is kind of that direction, right? The expectation would be that you had a concept, a hypothesis, right? You went ahead and created something, whatever that something may be, could be very, very lean, some sort of an MVP with which you went to either potential users or current users of something else. And you got quite clear both feedback from them and you got a sense for how and when would they be using this tool, right? So if you have any, so you can never have enough responses in this early on to have statistical significance, right? You're not gonna go for millions or hundreds of thousands, right? But have you observed or spoken with a hundred users, right? And not necessarily only of your own product, like using this framework, you could be observing how they're using something else, but something else that, you know, you basically will be replacing for that job. Do you understand that there is a real job to be done or are you constantly just talking about futures and everything is just a little bit goldier and a little bit more diamondy and a little bit better, right? That, that's just features. And um, on that alone, you hardly can build a company, right? So, so if, if a startup comes and, and you look and you understand it's an early stage idea, right? But if you see that the team is not digging like deep enough through this potential user interviews or observations even sometimes, and that they're not trying to get at that repeatable hire of that product. And all that they're talking about is demographics and features and benefits. You know, you start feeling a bit skeptical, right? Well, you ask them to go ahead and do that work if they haven't done it, right? And then they go do it and then they go, wow, oh, okay. <laughs> this is what we found out, right? No. Thank you very much. Of course. But I hear literally jobs to be done. And I even sometimes now see uh, abbreviation JTB and some people like, you know, it, it's kind of coming, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of coming as we speak, which is in a way why I wanted to present it. It's interesting because some places truly value it now and truly do work around it, you know, and in some it's still kind of a little bit, you know, un unusual of a subject. All right, so we're almost close to running out of our time, are we, right? Um, I hope that it was you know, useful in that it would sort of, speaking of toolboxes, right? It's, it's kind of like a, it, it's an instrument that allows to look at things from a different, very different angle right, than, than we commonly do as founders. No, totally. No, thanks, Olga, for doing this. This is super awesome. I know I really appreciate it. I know the Zoom example is still mind-bottling to me, um, so it's going to be on my mind all night. Um, but no, thank you for doing this. We'll definitely share this out um, and have it more in our networks. I know a lot of people have been watching this um, on YouTube or wherever, kind of like we have people watching asynchronously here. So I don't know. Thanks for doing this. And if people want to learn more about what your work you're doing, like where can they go just so people know? Uh, say again. And if people, if people want to learn more about like what the work you're doing at Techstars or whatnot, like where can they go to learn more? Maybe. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Well, first of all, we have you know a, a very robust website uh, where you can look up accelerators by vertical, by location, by anything you want. So if you want to reach me, it's pretty easy. I'm Olga at Techstars.com. Um, ideally, kind of you want to if you're thinking about going into an accelerator. The best thing to do is to think about which vertical you're in. We often have corporate partners in the verticals. Um, the you know, value of a corporate partner is that they just tend to help eliminate the path, you know, the, the distance to market and just reduce the time to market with potential uh, POCs and pilots. And um, you know, if I were launching something again, I probably would go to an accelerator again, even though I'm running one. It's what also it does, it just sort of, it's extreme laser focus on what you need to get done. It's a short amount of time, but it's just, just sort of, it's both an intellectually challenging because you are questioning everything. For example, 
if we were working today and you just started applying the jobs to be done framework to your own startup right now, you know, at the same time, maybe you met with a mentor earlier on who was talking to you about something completely else and was trying to convince you to do B2B versus B2C. Like, how do you, how do you combine all that? So it's intellectually challenging because there's so many things to answer. Um, there is very, very direct feedback from mentors, which, you know, sometimes can be a little bit disorienting because say you have seven mentors and each of them are very capable individuals and operators and say all seven, seven of them telling you seven different things to do, right? How do you reconcile that? Well, in the end, you are the master of your own company. You're the master of its fate. Um, and you take some, you know, questions and, and suggestions, but you are the one who is picking what to pay attention to, how to incorporate things and how to go forward. But it's, it's like, it's um, just, it just kind of picks you up and sweeps you into this, intellectual challenge because you're trying to really really distill what is that you have i guess which job it's doing right who the customers are how to get to them um and it's just it's it, it becomes emotionally challenging as well right at the same time very often when we have an intellectual challenge and we're challenging a lot of things about our idea we start feeling emotional at the same time it very nicely in a way tests your relationship with your co-founder because both of you are challenged at the same time, how you deal with this challenge, how you deal with stress, how you deal with getting to opposing um, advices and, and, and how do you decide you know, how to go about this. So it's both intellectual, emotionally challenging to be in an accelerator, but it gets you to this place of clarity in, in, in a very, very short amount of time, which I think is quite valuable. Uh, and it's that clarity that we'll look for as founders and reaching it as soon as possible. Totally. No, I like completely vouch for that. That B2B, B2C example you just brought up is actually like the same exact experience I had personally going through Techstars. So definitely can understand that. Um, no, thank you for being here, Olga. I know it's been a little bit crazy, especially we're being in this pandemic season. So thank you for being here. Thanks for being willing to share your wisdom and knowledge. Um, and to everyone, thank you for being here too. Um, I know Zoom fatigue is real. So thanks for being part of this.